Hi friends, this is John. I'm passionate about developing regenerative agriculture systems that improve soil health, produce crops that are completely resistant to diseases and insects, and produce food of such an exceptional quality that we can have a legitimate conversation about growing food as medicine. I've been fortunate to meet many people with incredible knowledge and information about soil and plant systems. However, much of this knowledge and information is scattered all over the place. I founded Advancing Eco Agriculture in 2006 to bring this knowledge together in a more coherent fashion and incorporate it into products and growing systems that growers can easily put into practice. It's my personal mission to have these regenerative agriculture systems become the mainstream globally, the status quo against which all other growing systems are compared. To achieve this goal, I want to share the knowledge that we have learned in the last decade and make it available to everyone. If you have any questions, suggestions, comments, or topics that you would like for me to discuss, please connect on social media or email me, john at regenerativeagriculturepodcast.com. Be sure to sign up for our email list at regenerativeagriculturepodcast.com. Hope you enjoy, and thank you for listening. This episode of the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast was recorded live at the Healthy Soil Summit in Davis, California in August 2019. My guest was Vernon Peterson, who I was very excited to have on. Vernon is an organic fruit grower and packer in California and has had a great deal of experience in developing a farming team that is very resilient and can execute well. This is a characteristic that is particularly important in biological agriculture, which is much more management intense than if we're using a lot of pesticide applications. Our community impact spot for this episode is Green Cover Seed. Green Cover Seed is a family-owned cover crop seed provider sharing the benefits of cover crops with the farming community. They've done an excellent job of conducting and disseminating research regarding new cover crop species, new blends, and the ways that they're using them. Hi, I'm Dale Strickler, an agronomist for Green Cover Seed in Bladen, Nebraska. We live on a planet that is by and large highly degraded soils. Hundreds of things are wrong with our soils. But there's only one solution that fixes all soil problems, and that's soil organic matter. We have 120 different species of cover crops that are designed to enhance some soil function or management goal to fit your needs. If you want to learn more about how to build your soils with cover crops, please visit our website, greencoverseed.com. Check out our YouTube channel. We have hundreds of videos. Or give us a call. 402-469-6784. There are many excellent cover crop providers out there, but Green Cover Seeds stands out with the information that they share and make readily available. Please check them out. At AEA, the Regenerative Soil Health Package is the cornerstone of the biological system that growers use to rapidly rebuild soil health. From now through September 17th, we're providing a special offer to growers who purchase this package. For more information, you can check out the AEA website, Google free plant sap analysis, or call our team at 800-495-6603. Happy growing. Hi friends. I am very honored to be here again today, and I'm very honored to have the wonderful Vern Peterson be able to share the stage with him. I've known Vern for a few years, and I won't even attempt to describe all the accolades that he has received from his fellow human beings and all the great work that he has done. I know that Vern doesn't like to be categorized and defined by the work that he's done, so I'll just begin by asking him the question, Vern, who are you? I think I'm an encourager. You, you definitely know, are. I think I'm an encourager. Um, I think I have the gift of encouragement, but others say it's the gift of irritation. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, wherever it is, family, employees, suppliers, customers, I think, I think that's my role. What is the difference between encouragement and irritation? <laughs> The, the, uh, the broad smile you have when you're uh, putting your thumb in somebody's back, I think. No, I, I think what we have to do, you know, everybody has their own possibilities, right? How do we get them to be able to achieve to their full potential? 
right? Yeah. Whether that's our kids, whether that's our employees, whether that's our customers, how do we help them be uh, better? I think that uh, if you come at it, John, from the perspective of I am here to give, that's the difference. Yeah. An, an irritator it wants something, right? Thank you. So as we approach this conversation about soil health and farming, for a bit of context, can you tell us a little bit about your operation and your background, what has brought you here today? So we farm about 300 acres of stone fruit. Uh, we grow peaches, plums, nectar, and apricots. We uh, pack fruit for about 80 of our neighbors, uh, including uh, beyond stone fruit, also pomegranates in the fall and citrus all winter. Uh, we grow, we have 11 chicken houses, so it's kind of rare to have a livestock component, but we grow organic chickens, uh, a couple hundred thousand at a time. Um, so that's what we do. We employ about 150 people year-round. And what do you do on your operation that is unusual from many of the other growers in the area? Well, it's all organic. Um, I think what's unique about us, John, we formed this alliance, and we make a bunch of little farmers look like one larger farmer, you know? Just helped a bunch of little guys uh, be very successful, and that's tough to do, as you know, in this, in this environment. I think that's what's different. Uh, in your alliance together, are you working to, uh, together for marketing and sales? Are you absolutely. cooperating in, in ways more than that? We're cooperating uh, in so many ways. All the compliance issues, we work together. So you can hire one person. You've you got to do food safety for the packing shed. Why not knock out worker safety while you're at it? If we're going to pay everybody to sit down and learn how to wash your hands after you go to the bathroom, uh, why not also talk about um, drink plenty of water on a hot day? It takes like 1% more, and if we, get, if we get everybody together, then we can deliver that at a cost that doesn't, it's delegated out, it gets done, and it's not a great burden on our farmers. Yeah. You know? I, I went off on three tangents there at once, sorry. Only three? <laughs> um, what are some of the memorable moments that have led you to where you are today? Well, I uh, graduated from high school in, in 75, first crop in 76. Uh, 78, my father died. Uh, 81, I got married. 83 and five, had two kids. Went broke in 85. Uh, in 90, uh, started over. Managed for a large farm for that interim. Uh, started over in 90. 2002, we flipped to organic. You know, and when you do organic, I think most of us, when we go down that path, we're looking for what's the organic alternative to what I was doing conventionally, right? That's the way our brain flows. That's how my brain flowed. Uh, there isn't one. There isn't one. Uh, organic's completely different. Organic's about life. Organic's about encouraging uh, the good guys. It's a very uh, different way of thinking. It's a whole different, and it's almost like an audible click you hear in a farmer's brain, you know, when it happens. We, for instance, our biggest challenge in stone fruit is dealing with a, we don't have synthetic fungicide. You know, so what do we do at bloom time? What do we do on a year like this where it rained and rained and rained and didn't stop raining till the end of May? You know, and we're out there, well, the initial thing was copper and sulfur. Kill it, kill the pathogen, right? We got our butt handed to us. Uh, we, we literally lost two orchards. Junk got in the wood, we couldn't get out and we had to doze them, you know. Uh, so the second year we flipped to life and spraying on probiotics, uh, and it worked. <laughs> it, it's still mind-boggling, but uh, getting, that, getting that cell, getting that little flower coated with good microorganisms prevents bad guys from getting established, and, uh, and it does it clear on through. So yeah, I've always said that it's much more powerful to be for something than it is to be against something, and that's particularly true when we're working with living systems. So 
the entire framework of working with probiotics versus antibiotics is always very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it extends to everything. It extends down to the soil. Uh, it's a holistic, taking a holistic view of everything instead of dealing with all the little parts and learning to be proactive instead of reactive. I think that's the biggest difference. An organic farmer doesn't have plan B, you know, so you have to anticipate the challenge and be ahead of it. It's wonderful to have this conversation about soil health and producing healthy plants, managing nutrition differently, but it's not it's very important and necessary to learn the information and to attend events such as this, but it's not enough just to have the information. You then have to effectively execute it. You have to make it work on your operation. And I know that one of the pieces that we've observed is that there are many growers who are really, really good at executing. And I, I want to come back to that piece, but I wanted to use that as a, a frame for this conversation I've obs also observed that the growers who are really good at getting things done generally tend to be the growers who d think very deeply about why they're doing what they're doing. And so my general observation has been that if you ask a grower, every single grower can tell you what they do. Some of them can tell you how they do it, and only a few of them can tell you why they do what you do. And I believe this is something you think very deeply about. So why do you do what you do? People. People. Why? So family. So my number one motivation is family. Number two is my employees, suppliers, customers. We have to create a biological productive system so that all of those people can have great lives. You know, our, our customers need to be eating really great food, um, and, and we've got to turn a profit at it. So the why is people. The why is people. And somehow, if you take care of, uh, uh, it, it isn't just about taking care of people, but that is the why. The, the how, the what, those are more specific. Efficiency, you have to be all of that. But I think the why is people if that makes sense. So I think that's appropriate coming from someone who self-identifies as the encourager. But let's, let's go back to the, the first part that I mentioned, that there are consistently some farms that I've observed that are very effective at executing and getting things done. And I think this is really the heart of the conversation that we want to get to. Uh, from your perspective, what are the important elements that need to be in place in order to be able... We, we know that when we're managing plant nutrition and we're managing biological systems, such critical windows of time, if you miss your window of opportunity, sometimes by a day or two, you've missed it for good, which makes management and execution of paramount importance. And I think some, that's something that I've observed your operation doing very, very well. What needs to happen in order to have that system in place? Well, you've got to unleash people to to achieve to their full potential. And, and you've got to give people identified responsibilities. You've got to give them the tools they need. But organic agriculture, it's not well scalable, is it, guys? It's not, it's not something you go do thousands of acres of. I think it's very intense. It's, it's intense management. So uh, how do you do it? In, in each enterprise, you in each aspect of each enterprise, you've got to identify two or three very important things. Then you've got to uh, figure out how to measure those. So it isn't easy, guys, to figure out what's important. That's a big question. That's what we get the big bucks for. But what's in this, in this practice we're doing right now, what's two or three really important things to do well? then how do you measure that? Yeah. You've, that isn't easy either, guys. What's important? How are you going to measure it? And then how are you going to publish that so everybody can see the results of that excellent execution? Why do you want to publish it? I'm not talking about putting it in Acres USA. I'm talking about putting it uh, every night Everybody involved in today's harvest knows the quality, how many pounds, 
uh, what happened. Everybody needs to know that today, not tomorrow. We are already on to the next thing. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm thinning peaches, very labor, very expensive thing, I've got a target. I'm supposed to be leaving 425 peaches on this tree. Am I achieving that? Where am I at? Uh, and, and it's not just about the boss knowing that I accomplished that. I need to know it. Everybody needs to know it. I need to know what it, uh, how much time it took me to do that. And when you can get that down, it's magic. When you can get those three things, guys, measure, uh, identify, measure, and publish. Anything that's, in, anything that's measured and published improves automatically is the quote. But when you get those things, then you can reward for them financially. You can give incentives to the, to the executor of that. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's just, it's, it's beyond magic. Uh, we're, we're in California, right? We're at 12 bucks, we're 13 bucks in three or four months. We're headed for 15. Who knows what they'll do after that? How are you going to, 80% of my cost is labor. If I don't have the most efficient people, <laughs> if I don't have the most efficient people, I'm never going to make it. You know, I think so many people focus on how cheap can I get this done. And that is totally backwards. I've got to focus. You've got to focus. And we can all do it. If everybody unleashed their labor force to produce at their full potential, <laughs> it's magic. Uh, okay, you take any, put 100 guys out there doing something. I don't care. Pick the task. And they're all getting rewarded. We're going to get paid to pick up a box of rocks. I don't know. Pick your task. The most productive employee will be performing 50% more than the average. You know that to be true. I see lots of heads nodding, OK? Your least productive will be doing half of the average, OK? That's if everybody's unleashed to pull at their full potential, and they're being rewarded for it, OK? If you pay everybody the same, nobody does more than the guy who's doing the least. And he's doing 20% less. This is just basic econ 101. If you're doing any productivity study, this isn't something Vernon dreamt up, although I've observed it uh, <laughs> big time. I I'll give you a, a very concrete example. We were harvesting. It was at 9 bucks an hour. It was costing me $0.08 cents a pound. We were already measuring and publishing. So I knew, what my co I knew the quality of what was coming in. I set up a deal where I don't pay you if you pick it green. I double dock you if there's mechanical damage, and I don't pay you for decay. Using that formula, picking at nine bucks an hour, it cost me eight, uh, cents, a pound. eight cents a pound. And it went the next year to 10. So I knew, so I said, guys, I'm going to pay you eight cents a pound or 10 bucks an hour, whichever is greater. OK? Anybody would take that deal. I can't lose. I got an up. I don't got it down. Uh, what do you think they earned at eight cents a pound, unleashed to do all they could? Twenty-five bucks. <laughs> 1973. The wow. same people went from that were getting nine bucks an hour. The next year, getting earning the same as what it cost me. So I had a ten percent reduction in cost. Right? And the people made 1973. Who, everybody liked paying less, and, and my quality got better. My quality wow. got better, which is the main thing if you've got retailers in the audience. If, if we come in with mechanical damage, I can't get it out in the shed. It ends up in the box, and it decays. Uh, so one of the magic about our product is it's Everybody's working hard, but they're being real careful. And when they come up to the trailer, they don't just stack another one on top, squish, because that's double dock, right? They take the extra ones off and put them in a box and set them up. It, it almost makes you cry. <laughs> I, I kid you not, to see people working so hard. Yeah. Vernus is a very important piece because 
I am very blessed and very fortunate because I get the perspective of being able to observe a lot of different farms and a lot of different growers. And consistently, I've observed that those growers who are the most successful have extraordinary relationships with their employees. And you mentioned a phrase a moment ago, Vern, that, that some people try to get things done as cheaply as possible, but that you would prefer to, if I understood it correctly, you would prefer to pay them better. I want yeah. to give them a chance to earn more. Yeah. I want to give them the tools to earn more, and I want to pay less. You want to win-win, absolutely. Who's with me? <laughs> Everybody, yeah. yeah. Everybody's with me. So everybody on our farm and their family, guys, so those 150 employees, they've all got access to a nurse practitioner. They've all got dental. They've all got vision. They've all got 4% matching 401k on top of, you know, four years ago is 19.73 an hour. So now it's 20-something. That's impressive. You know, but my cost... Your cost has gone down. Guess who ain't got a labor problem? Exactly. You know, guess where everybody wants to work. Yeah. But it's so amazing how farmers can't get that through their head. They, they don't, and I have farmers won't do it. Send me people for 12 bucks an hour. You know, I've got crews that don't want the piecework. Guess why they don't want the piecework? They don't want to work that hard. So I send that farmer the $12 crew, you know? They just can't stomach writing the check for the 20-something an hour. So in this entire conversation about piecework and, and having um, really valuable employees that are, they're not employees, but they really are a team that wants to contribute to the entire farm, how, does, how has that affected your ability to execute and to implement all these various, uh, in addition to the tree management, um, irrigation and cultural management, uh, weeding, the stuff that is very time sensitive, the stuff that perhaps isn't piecework. Yeah. What I find is if uh, five days out of this week I made really good money and one day we're going to go shovel Johnson grass, everybody grabs their shovel and shovels Johnson grass, you know, and, and we get a lot done. So it isn't like every day we're going to shovel Johnson grass, but we got to shovel Johnson grass. <laughs> it isn't going away by itself, and we don't have Roundup. You know, we spend 15 grand shoveling Johnson grass. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new herbicide, organic herbicide called shovel. <laughs> I've called it steel in the past. Or there iron. is no resistance built up yet to this herbicide. It's a solid application of iron. <laughs> and I would, somebody said, why not do it piecework? I would if I could figure out how to measure and publish it, you know? Because if it was just, you know, how do you know? This row's got a bunch, the next five don't have any. Uh, and if you don't go down three feet sometimes to get that last rhizome out, you're right back where you were next month. So I haven't been able to quant there you go. If you've got your, if you can figure out how to measure it and publish it, you can apply piecework to any application. And not just labor. You know, you've got to be applying it to your, all your productivity. You need to know whether that check to AEA is getting you uh, a return, right? Uh, so you've got to do some tests. In the packing shed, you know, we pull a box from Mary, then we pull a box from Jane, we enter it in an iPad. She's getting 56 cents a box. Um, but to find out how much she earned today, next to the time clock, cleanest packer, dirtiest packer. You go find your name and then you know how much you earned, you know. Uh, you may not give a rat's rear whether you're the cleanest packer at the Peterson family, but you don't want to be the worst. That's human nature. And so uh, you can apply this to the farmers. You know, uh, every, every 10 minutes we pull a 25-piece sample off the cull line and we quantify and we say, Farmer Bob, you, we measure the weight coming in, we measure the weight going out, the difference is your culls. Farmer Bob, you lost this many pounds of fruit to this defect, this many to that defect, this many to that defect. You've got to measure and publish. Otherwise, you're just saying, man, Charlie, you got a lot of worms that's eating your lunch. 
if he sees he lost 3,000 pounds, that's 3,000 bucks, what could he have done to fix that, you know? But until you measure and publish, you, you don't, uh, you're not getting anywhere. I, tell me to shut up. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Vern, there, there's, I get excited there's many this. questions I want to ask in so many directions this conversation could go, but I, I'd like to focus, we, we talked a little bit about the cost side, but how should farmers prioritize the revenue side? What is important? And I think that this, uh, I heard a comment this uh, last week that was not new, but just the way it came across kind of hit me in the face like a two by four. It said that the definition of a commodity is where the market price equals the cost of production. Or less. That's, the, or less. <laughs> yeah. And so why would you want to grow a commodity? That's one question, but I think another more relevant question for or equally appropriate question for us to think about is how do we actually manage the price of the product that we are producing? So, question, Vern, that's a question I would have for you. Most farmers, I believe, do it backwards. They start with production and they move to sales. Am I right? No. I think that's where we're at. And it doesn't do me any good to be the cheapest raisin farmer. Uh, so we have to start with sales. Uh, you need to sell it at a profit, then go grow it. I know that sounds crazy, but that's where you have to start. And in my world, it's about balance. So my world of stone fruit production, this week, I have to have a yellow peach, a white peach, a yellow nectarine, a white nectarine, a red plum, a black plum, a pluot, and an apricot in various volumes, and I have to have that this week. Storage can average the, uh, we pick more today and not tomorrow, but this week I have to have that. A field of peaches produces for a week. That means I did all of that this week, and I do it again next week and I do it again the week after that, and I do it again the week after that, May to September. That's my world. And I can't do that by myself, so we have lots of little farmers, and we get together, and we say, uh, like today, uh, I know I'm going to have a hole in nectarines in about 10 days. So, if somebody wants to plant something, we got to find you a good nectar that comes about 10 days from today, okay? That's my world, balance. It's all about balance. And here's why it's so profitable. If I just had peaches, very inorganic, they're not going to fill a truck with peaches. They got to fill a truck, in our case, with all of those stone fruit commodities plus I've got a partner doing blueberries and another one doing table grapes, and those all go in the same truck at the same price. That's worth three to five bucks more per box by having all of that on the truck going to Earl's Organics back here. Okay? Uh, start with sales. Then uh, how do you differentiate yourself? The second most important thing is packaging. It isn't farming. Sell it. Package it in a memorable way, in an effective way, in an efficient way, in a way that meets the need. Maybe for this customer, they need things in a grab-and-go package, and you can eliminate their labor and, and increase their ring-through by doing that for them. Maybe someone else likes to build displays. You have to be able to put it up all those ways. Uh, and it's very expensive. That packaging is expensive, the sorting, at least in my world. And to have the equipment to do, uh, you know, the, the stone fruit and then the pomegranates and then the citrus. It's the same people, same building, different, different applications. Then third is labor. So start with sales rather than starting with production. Focus on having really good packaging. And then I think... The question that many growers ask themselves for the, or they should be asking themselves for the crops they're producing is, what are the characteristics that consumers care about? And ultimately, what are the characteristics that you need to care about as a result of that? 
Yeah, there's a real challenge. Because what we don't sell food to people who eat food. Doesn't that suck? It does. We sell food to people who sell food. And don't want to discount anybody. It says in the thing here that, I, that I'm running a CSA called Abundant Harvest Organics. And I did until a year ago, April. We had 5,500 families up and down the state. And it was a hoot. In that case, everybody knew I marketed myself as Uncle Vern. Everybody knew Uncle Vern. They could email me. You know, it was such a hoot. And we were taking produce from the farm to the people. We've lost that, you know, in modern agriculture. We're not. So what's important, what's important to me today is to score a, a 5 out of 10 on uh, appearance, flavor, and durability. Okay. Durability? That mm -hmm. sounds like a good recipe for cardboard. Yeah. But if it does not make it to Toronto and get over the cash register, y you with the store in Toronto aren't going to buy it. So we've got to have those things then in a supply chain that's balanced. And I think, you know, a bunch of small farmers could work together to meet that if, if we work together. We, we are accomplishing it in our little world. I think it could happen all over the country. Yeah, I think the cooperative that you have is very powerful, something that none of you could do on your own. Absolutely. To... Ain't none of us smart as all of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Vern, in the path that you've been on for the last 40 years and now being a very long-time organic farmer, what do you believe to be true about modern agriculture that many others might perhaps not believe to be true? We can feed the world organically, and we can do it without an increase in cost. Yes. If, if, there, <laughs> if, there, if, if, if you said in five years you could not use a conventional chemical, the challenge would be finding the farmers. It wouldn't be producing yeah. the food. Because here's the secret. Conventional agriculture isn't about, well, it's about cheaper, which is why we have this problem. But it's not about cheaper production cost. It's about easier. And we're old, aren't we? The average, I'm 62. The average farmer, I hear, 64. So I'm the kid, you know? The greatest, the greatest transfer of agricultural real estate during peacetime in the history of the world is happening in the United States of America over the next six, seven years maybe eight or nine. The, the old farmer doesn't have an heir. You guys are different. That's why you're here trying to make things better. But that's the general case. So half the farmland is going to transfer. Half the farmland is going to transfer. Half the farmland is going to transfer, certainly in the next decade. No other way around it. Half. The agricultural production, that means half go away, the other half doubled in size. Basic that's one, math. That's one outcome, yeah. Or probably half went away, and 10% of the other half can tupled in size. Yeah. You know, it's a real deal. I'm on the bank board, ag, uh, farm credit bank board, and, you know, the loans we're writing aren't three and $500,000 loans anymore. They're... Yeah. <laughs> it's really interesting. Loans, you know? uh, I haven't I haven't seen the most recent uh, or haven't analyzed the most recent USDA census, but in the 2015 census, in the U.S., fruit, nut, and vegetable growers, there were 69,335 fruit, nut, and vegetable growers in the country, and of those, 6,923 had greater than half a million in annual revenue and produced that group produced 90 percent of the total supply chain. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> that's less than 7,000 growers producing 90% of the total fruit, nut, and vegetable supply chain in North America or in the U.S. So what uh, do I believe? I believe we can do it organically. I believe we can reinvigorate agriculture through organic. I believe strongly, and I was going to get to this later, but if we could validate and if we can enlist you guys as a volunteer army, I believe if we could validate 
the superior nutrition of what this conference is about and then market that, we just fix the agricultural problems. Because agriculture is a, and the, the, the industrial complex is about cheap, right? But the consumer isn't about cheap. It blew my mind the first, I paid $2.50 in the LA airport for a stinking bottle of Aquafina, you know? The consumer isn't averse to paying. Uh, if we could document, if we could verify, if you're confident that what you're growing has superior nutrition and we could document that and verify it and then market it, I'm not sure how, under some, this produce has 50% greater nutrition, some sort of a label like that, I don't know. Uh, I think you're the guy that could lead that charge. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you, you know, we could quit making what we're doing be, be about the price. You know, when it's about the price, we're done. Then it's just, who's going to be the cheapest producer? Yeah. So. Uh, you, you, you preempted the question that I was going to ask, yeah, which know. is, um, how, how do we trigger this transition when you say that you believe we can feed the world organically, what would have to be true to get to that place? What would have to be true in order to be able to feed the world organically? Well, you'd have to believe it. What the mind can conceive and believe it can achieve, right? Yep. So you'd have to believe it's true. I know it's true on my own farm because yep. we, we can match production with anybody. I can match production cost with anybody. And we've got the intense stuff, right? Yeah. Well, I, you mentioned one, uh, another element of this, which what I've observed is that the growers who are doing a really good job, even organically, consistently, are also the low-cost producers. They're the high return producers, but they're generally also the low-cost producers. If you do your job well, you should be the low-cost producer because you can produce more efficiently and more effectively, in my experience. You know, we do better every year, and we might get there... Right now, I can say I'm even, you know, but I, I truly believe, why wouldn't we? You know, uh, we've completely eliminated mites. Uh, you know, there is a cost. We cut one oriental fruit moth all year, and we cut 300 pieces out of every lot because we ship to Canada. So if they were there, we would know they're there. There's another cost. Yeah. Um, we've cut our cultivation in half this year which was a big cost, burning a lot of diesel. So in, the, in this context of, of thinking about costs and managing costs, you, you, we keep circling around this conversation. How important is it to know and to publish your economic information to the decision makers on the team as compared to the labor force? How important is it to know that, to where your costs are going? <laughs> well, you're not in business if you don't know where your costs are. And if the people making that happen don't know, then you haven't published. You know, I'm toying, there's this thing called the great game of business, you might have heard of it, but you know, it's basically opening your books to your employees. It's kind of a scary thought, you know, but at least your key players need to know uh, not only cost, but income and, and, uh, and how we're doing. A lot of people don't do that. I think everybody wants to do that. A lot of people don't do that because they don't have the software. So you've got to get software that uh, writing a check distributes that cost. You have to have software that can distribute to a group. So that irrigator works so many hours on the Schaefer farm, so many on the Coster farm, et cetera, and that gets spread. We know exactly to the penny what we spent, you have to pay the irrigator anyway. Why not spread it? Uh, you have to pay the power bill, so when you enter the meter number, it spreads those dollars over these acres. So you've got to have software that does that. Uh, it needs to spread to groups, and it needs in labor uh, to be able to put in that this group is doing this activity at this price, and then if it's the whole group, you put in the total 
quantity, and it spreads it. Or if everybody's working individually, you still fill that header, and then you just put Charlie, 174 units, Bill, 116. You know, and you, you, well, you've got to have your costs. Vern, if there was one thing that you could change about agriculture, what would it be? It would, re it would be to reconnect us with our consumer. Okay. I think if we did that, I think if, if we knew that that watermelon was going to Bill and Betsy's family, it would be different than filling a bin of watermelons. Yeah. What is something that you wish you would have known 44 years ago? I wish I knew that the goal wasn't to be the cheapest raisin producer. You know, that would, that's a dead end. So I went broke, <laughs> learned, started over. But it, had I known that, I wouldn't have. I would have completely, uh, I would have started from a different base. So I have a couple more questions for Vern, and then we're going to open it up for a Q&A for any questions that you might have for Vern or for myself. So I see a couple microphones floating around. If you have any questions for Vern, please raise your hand, and we'll make sure that you get those. Um, the, the one question I think is uh, I always like asking people and uh, listeners tell me they really like hearing the answer to is uh, what resources would you recommend to other growers? What are resources that have really helped you that you would recommend other people pay attention to? Anybody ever read The Stockman Grass Farmer? Yeah. There are a bunch of hands. Don't you love that? I don't grow cattle or sheep or anything, but I love that magazine. I love the way they think. I love the way they market. Have, have you read Stockman yes, Grass? Yes, yeah. I get it, yeah. I've turned a lot of people on to that, and they think, why would I do that? But most everybody who subscribes uh, thanks me. So there you go. Good. Thanks, Vern. <laughs> What's the question you wish I would have asked? Well, how we're going to implement uh, documenting nutrition. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and uh, turning the tide of, of agriculture in America. You know, saving small farms. The kids aren't leaving the farm because they don't want to farm. They're leaving because they're not making any money at it. Yeah, that's right? very true. So we've got to turn that. If we're going to turn it, we're going to turn it by providing something the consumer wants. The consumer wants organic at a fair price that has superior nutrition. And they're not afraid to pay for it. So, so how are you going to do that, John? Uh, the how is easy, but I, I want to just, uh, I, I have some question marks about your approach to the why. When, when you say that growers are willing to pay for higher quality, that they would be willing to consumers, pay for higher, uh, sorry, yes, I misspoke. Consumers are willing to pay for quality and they're willing to pay for nutrition. If that is the case, then um, why do we have organics still representing such a small percentage of the total supply chain? Well, I don't know. Have you ever read Tipping Point? Yes. So, you know, we're, we're growing at this incremental level close to to 8 to 11% a year, you know, varying commodity. We're getting close to that tipping. You, you, you get up to, what, 20, 25%, and all of a sudden... Yeah, greater than 18, usually. But, okay. Vern, I have a challenge with that, because I'm a young guy, and I'm really impatient, and I want it to happen fast. Mm -hmm. So my desire would be to see this approach to agriculture of being nutrition-focused become the mainstream globally in 10 years, not in 50. I think you'll get there in 10. Uh, <clears throat> Good. You know, uh, <laughs> because I'm 62, so I don't got a lot of time. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, success, one definition of success is where uh, opportunity meets preparedness. So if we're not prepared to document our superiority, and maybe we're not, huh? Maybe yeah. we're not superior. Maybe the organic isn't superior. Yeah. Maybe every, you know, if it isn't, we need to know that too. We're greenwashing. You yeah. know, that would be hypocritical. Uh, but if it is true, and I don't know why it isn't, if, if I've got superior nutrition in my soil, but I don't know for a fact that my peach, I have anecdotal evidence. I have anecdotal evidence of how it ships. I have anecdotal evidence of uh, flavor, uh, 
but I can't give you a guaranteed analysis that says this peach is superior nutritionally to that peach. If we have that, and so that's where preparedness comes in. Yeah. You know, we, you, you have to be able to present a compelling story and the consumer loves us. The consumer hates agriculture, but they love farmers. It's very true. You know, and it's crazy. It's crazy. We score down there with uh, used car salesmen when you talk about agriculture. And we score with the clergy when you talk about farmers. And it's the same guy. <laughs> uh, but if, if the consumer wants us to be successful, they don't want us to be bankrupt. Yeah. They want to pay us a good price for our food but we have, to, it's on us to show that we have a superior product. How many of you here are familiar with the Bionutrient Food Association? Okay. A number of you are, but not nearly enough. So the Bionutrient Food Association and the Real Food Campaign, a nonprofit organizations out of Massachusetts, uh, Dan Kittredge is kind of the spokesperson of these organizations. And Dan has been passionate about this conversation of documenting food quality for uh, over a decade. Uh, he and I have known each other. We've had this conversation on a continual basis. And Dan has been passionate and has recently been successful in developing a handheld, non-destructive meter that can measure the nutritional profiles of virtually any crop that you expose it to. So, so what does that mean, nutritional profile? Well. First, let me say that they're still in the process of developing, but the uh, spectrophotometer can measure a signature of different wavelengths that are emitted that then correspond to different nutrients and different elements. So their intention and their goal is to be able to manage or to measure the nutritional profile in terms of mineral assays, calcium, magnesium, boron, sulfur, etc., but then also all of the important and beneficial plant secondary <clears throat> metabolites, the phytoalexins, the terpenoids, all these aromatic compounds that plants produce that provide flavor and aroma and immune benefits. So the desire and the intent is to be able to measure all of this non-destructively so a consumer can measure on the grocery store shelf, a food buyer can use it to measure, a farmer can use it to measure, um, they released the first prototype of this device last year, and uh, I think there's about a thousand or so units that are being used across the country. They're in the process right now of developing a library, a database of energy signatures for these different crops that they can then correlate the signatures to specific nutritional parameters. So what is missing right now and what still needs to be developed is the database. So. The Bionutrient Food Association is looking for volunteers to use this device, collect data in the field, and develop a database of signatures that we can then correspond to specific nutritional profiles. When we have that database, we will be able to do exactly what Vern is describing. And that then gives us the foundational framework to, as you described, Vern, to put together a marketing campaign based on nutritional quality. Now we can differentiate based on quality. and. I will also say that just based on um, our experience with sap analysis, working with a lot of different growers, organic fruits and vegetables that are produced in this country, uh, about 40% of them are the absolute best quality that you will find in the grocery store because those are the growers that really pay attention to soil health and nutrition. They try to do a really good job. And the remaining 60% are the worst quality in the grocery store because those are the growers that manage organics by input substitution, trying to use other uh, control mechanisms to control diseases in insects. There's also and organic by default instead of design, so you just don't do anything and it's organic. Yeah, it's called organic by neglect. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we have time for a few questions, if there are any. Yes. Actually, why don't you go ahead in the back? Have you thought about creating relationship with your customers directly, the end consumer? Yeah, I've done that. It's really hard. We have some retail partners that are excellent at it, and they want their, their customer 
to know that the Peterson family grew this peach, but that's the rare exception. We did a thing like, a, we pack Costco, we pack Walmart, we pack it all. Uh, so Costco goes out in a five or six pound consumer pack. We put a QR code on the end of it. Click the QR code with your phone and it'll, it'll take you to our farm and show you all what wonderful people we are, right? And how to get a hold of us and how to come visit and all of that. We put out uh, about a million five of those boxes. Guess how many people clicked it? <laughs> Yeah, five. It was something you could count on two hands, you know. It was really, uh, so it's a challenge. It's a, it's a real challenge. So I don't know how to do it. Yes, let's go here. I want to circle back to what you were talking about with the software and communication. I mean, first of all, congratulations for having 150 year-round employees in Stonefruit or, and, and, and in Citrus and everything else. That's a, for something that is so seasonal, when you have a high crew demands for thinning and high crew demands for picking, but the rest of the year it's, it's not that 150 people, it's really amazing to have a business where you've been able to have that continuity. Thank you. When it comes to software, you know, it's a struggle, it's, it's enough of a struggle to find a, a financial software that will even do the farm itself, much less communicate that back to the decision makers. So have you? And, and the cost of making your own software or, 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 or paying somebody to make your own software is you know, not insignificant. So ha have you come up with your own software for that? Are you using a commercial package? And how do you communicate back to those decision makers or even to the rest of the crew what you know, the, the metrics that you're using based on that check that you wrote to that employee or that cost center? Are you using an amalgamation of different pieces or are you using one particular package? Yeah, so we use... Um for about 30 years, uh, a software called, uh, it was BizBooks, now it's called AgBooks. <clears throat> I commissioned, I paid a guy to go find me something better and I couldn't. So BizBooks is, or AgBooks now, the guy's name is Bob Weens. He's a really great guy. Uh, and his stuff works and he answers his phone. So whatever that's worth. It's got the reports you need, it's got the formulas. It does it by group, it does it by individual. You can set up a thousand cost centers or enterprises if you like. Uh, it's really challenging to be in that business because uh, California keeps changing the rules and they change them retroactively. So uh, it's like they're determined to kill us, but we're hard to kill. <laughs> uh, so for instance, uh, break times. You know, if you're piecework, you've got to be paying the piecework rate during break. Uh, and they made that retroactive. It cost me 75 grand to go back uh, two and a half years and pay people the, I won't go there. <laughs> but uh, we've, we've got time for one more question and then I know Vern and I will both be available here after. So let's go into the back to the microphone. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, if, if we're going to go from a few percent to 50, 60, 80 percent, it has to be more affordable than it is today, um, given especially the distribution of income. Um, you know, we, I, in this country, quantity is emphasized over quality, and then there's a lot of waste as well. So is there some way in which quality can be made more sexy and in place of quantity, the heaping plate, um, for enough, if it is really good. And um, I wonder whether that's the formula, along with less waste, so farmers can be paid more uh, than they are today. At the same time, we eat better than we do today with less waste. Is there, I don't know whether that's a possible approach. Vern, what are your thoughts? Uh, we've been really successful creating uh, number uh, two and three box so that you can get most of the stuff sold. Uh, you know, the cosmetic defects and things. With yeah. organic, I haven't been successful. We, we still pack, I still have a handful of conventional growers who want me to pack their fruit and they just can't switch to organic, so I still do some conventional. We haven't been able to accomplish that to the same level with conventional. But there's a kind of a movement right now, the ugly fruit, the, 
you know, the, the, uh, there's several companies we work with that specialize in that uh, number two stuff. I don't know if that helps you, sir, but uh, yeah, it's a great ideal. <laughs> I, I think there is one element of that ideal that um, it would be useful for us to understand uh, collectively, which is that unhealthy fruit, or and I could say low nutritional integrity fruit, rots. High nutritional integrity fruit doesn't rot, it dehydrates. Yeah. It will dehydrate but not rot. And so there, when, we, when we have this entire conversation about food waste and food uh, loss, uh, food waste, it's like something like 40 or 45 percent of the entire supply chain. Uh, so that's a huge amount of, a huge proportion of the quantity and the food that people grow, that farmers grow, never reaches people's plates. And you could actually say that that is a quality problem, that that is a nutritional problem. And that if we produced higher nutrition food, a greater proportion of it would reach people's plates. Not all of it. That wouldn't account for all the loss, but I think it would account for a very significant factor, a very significant amount of that loss. So, Vern, I want to thank you for joining us and for sharing your thoughts. And if you have any further questions, Vern and I will be here for a while. Thank you. The team at AEA and I are dedicated to bringing this show to you because we believe that knowledge and information is the foundation of successful regenerative systems. At AEA, we believe that growing better quality food and making more money from your crops is possible. And since 2006, we've worked with leading professional growers to help them do just that. At AEA, we don't guess, we test, we analyze, and we provide recommendations based on scientific data, knowledge and experience. We've developed products that are uniquely positioned to help growers make more money with regenerative agriculture. If you are a professional grower who believes in testing instead of guessing, someone who believes in a better, more regenerative way to grow, visit advancingecoag.com and contact us to see if AEA is right for you. Thank you for listening and we look forward to working with you.